delighted that um, Monta has found the time to speak to us today. Um, as as you, several of you, you will have seen from their webinar, um, his last webinar was going to talk about the theology of the land. I believe we're now going to listen to um, a lecture about the, the actual situation here in Palestine. Uh, welcome to Bethlehem. Uh, and uh, some of you already met me at the webinar, but just uh, to repeat, I am the pastor of the Lutheran Church here in Bethlehem. And at the same time, I am the academic dean of Bethlehem Bible College. Uh, and what I will do today is share with you about uh, Palestinian uh, Christian uh, life, uh, the life of Palestinian Christians here, our situation, our challenges, uh, in addition to our, uh, how we are dealing with, uh, with the conflict. Uh, and before talking about anything about our uh, responses, it's, it's important to understand our uh, uh, reality. So in the first part, I will introduce to you the Palestinian Christian community. And in the second part, I will talk about the challenges. And uh, if we have time in the end, I will talk about some of our responses uh, to these uh, challenges. I do talking for a living. That's what I do. I preach and teach. So <laughs> be more than happy to speak for 50 minutes or an hour. Uh, I'd rather have a, a conversation. Of course, I, you know, many people are surprised to know that Palestinian Christians exist. Uh, and many times um, when they hear about a Christian from Bethlehem, they assume we converted uh, or we are immigrants. But the reality is Christianity has been part of this world ever since Christ. Christ was born here. In the West, many, you're accustomed to link Arab with Islam, uh, whereas historically speaking, Arab Christianity is older than Islam. Uh, and this part, when we talk about the Palestinian Christian uh, life, it's important to realize that Palestine, as a geopolitical place, land, geography, has always been occupied. Uh, so when we talk about the history of the church here, uh, history of Christianity in this land, uh, we are part of the people of this land. And the people of this land, our history, as you see in the slide, is, is one of one empire after the other, one occupation after the other. Going back from biblical times, uh, as you see, from the Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, and so on, up to the modern era. More recently, we had the, uh, after the Crusaders and the Egyptians, we had the 400 years of brutal Ottoman rule, uh, then the British mandate, and today, uh, at least in this part of, of the land. Uh, the people of the land don't rule themselves. Uh, and that has become part of our, not just reality, but sadly, our identity uh, as people who always live in the shadow of occupations and uh, empire. Just think of that. This, the people of this land never ruled uh, themselves. The identity of the church, of course, uh, is fluid and kept changing based on uh, the occupier. Uh, but ever since the Arabs came, uh, we are part of, you know, we have been Arabized, the Byzantine church, then an Arab Byzantine church. Uh, in the 20th century, we had uh, Western churches come. Uh, and for the last 200 years or so, uh, it's, we have a very clear sense of identity. Some even say it's older than that, as uh, Palestinian uh, Christians. Now, uh, because of this long history of conflicts and wars and occupations. Sadly, our numbers are in constant uh, decline today. We are talking about a very small community on both sides of the divide who are uh, still, who are uh, Christians. Uh, the political situation is very difficult and the church is really facing existential threats. We are really concerned about the situation 20, 30 years from now mainly because of immigration. People are leaving because life here is difficult, as I will, as I will explain. Uh, here are some numbers to explain, uh, uh, that, that illustrate uh, the reality here. Uh, on both sides of the, of the divide, we have about 180,000 Palestinian Christians, uh, uh, the descendants or who have been here for hundreds, if not thousands uh, of years. Uh, 180,000. The majority are on the other side of the wall in the Nazareth area in, in Galilee. Uh, those would be Palestinians who hold an Israeli passport, uh, who live, as I said, in, in, in the north uh, mainly. Uh, and on this side of the wall, we have around 45,000 Palestinian Christians. 
uh, who live, like me, under a dual reality. We have a Palestinian authority or a Palestinian government, but in reality, the ultimate authority here is the Israeli military. Uh, we are occupied. We are an occupied people, if you want even an occupied government, because Israel, as I will explain, controls uh, everything. Uh, so we are divided into, because of the politics, into even though we are one community, but into these uh, reality. The situation of the 130,000 who live on the Israeli side is, is actually better than ours, because they benefit from uh, the Israeli, uh, some of the things in the state of Israel, but at the same time there are some discrimination against them. By the way, just to illustrate the numbers, uh, at the beginning of the 20th century we were around 13%. 1945 we were around 8%. Uh, we were more in numbers and more in percentage, uh, yet our numbers now keep declining. Our percentage declines mostly because of, uh, first, the Jewish immigration, and second, the, the uh, Palestinian immigration. Palestinians are leaving, both Muslims and Christians uh, are leaving uh, uh, this land. Population-wise, if you look at the Christian community uh, in the state of Israel, uh, you will realize that it's a very small number, 130,000 uh, among 8.7 million. Uh, of course, there is uh, around 1.5 million Arabs uh, not everyone is, 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 is Jewish uh, there. Uh, but keep in mind that the situation, as I said, yes, it is better, but it's not that much uh, better because Israel today defines itself as a Jewish state. Uh, and they just, for example, by passed a law, uh, if you heard about the nation state law that says uh, the right for self-determination in the state of Israel is unique to the Jewish people. Uh, this is clear discrimination about, against the indigenous people uh, of the land. So the situation of Palestinians in general, that includes the Christian community in Israel, is that of second-class citizens uh, in their own homeland, uh, if you know what I mean. Because of uh, laws uh, like this, uh, this is how the Christian community breaks down. The majority are Malachites and Greek Orthodox, uh, and then uh, Catholics. If we talk about uh, uh, the Palestinian on this side, uh, we have a majority of Greek Orthodox, uh, then some Latin Catholics and few Protestants and uh, uh, Evangelicals. Uh, our situation here is characterized by uh, uh, the Israeli military occupation, and I will focus more about that uh, later. By the way, uh, the 45,000 Palestinian Christians make 1% or less of the Palestinian population that lives under the occupation. Uh, we have around 4.8 million Palestinians. Uh, uh, about 2.8 or 2.9 live in the West Bank and East Jerusalem, and 1.9 live in Gaza. Uh, and 45,000 out of 4.8 means we are less than 1% uh, of the total Palestinian population on this side uh, of the war. Palestinian getting an Israeli passport, and what does, what does that mean for them? Uh, they're living as, yes. Israelis. So uh, those, uh, the ones who have the Israeli passport are the Palestinians who survived the war in 1948 and did not become refugees. Uh, when Israel was created in 1948, half of the Palestinians became refugees. People forget that. People th think many times that uh, Jews came to an empty land and established a state. No, they came and, you know, pretty much cleansed uh, whole areas of Palestinians. Uh, but some survived. Uh, and uh, those who survived lived for about 19 years under military occupation. Uh, they were not granted citizenship. Uh, later, uh, under international pressure, Israel made them citizens, so they gave them the passports. Uh, they benefit from many privileges uh, that any uh, citizen of Israel gets. Uh, they can travel freely in and out uh, the country, into our territory and out, because we cannot go to the Israeli side, for example. Um, um, they get health care uh, and so on. Where you see clear discrimination against them is in the investment the state puts in their towns and cities. Uh, in comparison, 
uh, to how much they spend on Israeli Jewish towns and cities uh, in Israel. Uh, to see that, I'm not sure if you've been to Galilee, all you need to go is to go visit Nazareth and then visit Upper Nazareth, uh, the new section. Now they have a new name for it, actually. Uh, and you will discover that there is a town uh, or a big city where Palestinians live, uh, where the streets are not developed, where uh, obviously uh, you know, the infrastructure is not that good, it's crowded. And then you go to the Jewish side, uh, and it looks like Europe. Uh, similarly, in schools and education and hospitals, uh, there is uh, a lot of uh, discrimination. And, and more importantly, because the Arabs there or the Palestinians do not take part in the, in the army because they don't want to find their own people, uh, when you take part of the army, you get a lot of privileges, especially in education and, uh, and so on. So they don't get these uh, privileges. Uh, there are other issues like family reunification. It's hard for them to nationalize their spouses if they are not Israelis in comparison to the Jewish Israeli citizenship, citizens, uh, which is a serious issue. Uh, one of, uh, you know, my brother-in-law uh, is from Haifa, his Israeli passport. He married to a Palestinian from Ramallah. Uh, you know, in their documents, he's a single father. Uh, she cannot uh, get citizenship, she cannot drive. Uh, why, when she lives there, she doesn't get health care or any of that, uh, the benefits that uh, a Jewish person who marries an American get. Uh, we take pride not just by the fact that we have been here for hundreds of years as Palestinians, but also as Christians and carry the, uh, uh, carry kind of the message and heritage of Christianity in this land. This is a quote uh, from Mitri Rahib, the pastor here for 30 years. My identity was stamped by the fact that I was born in this particular place. I feel I have something like a special relationship to David and to Christ. Uh, a relationship developed not only by way of the Bible, not only through faith, but also by way of land. I share my city and my land with David and Jesus. My self-understanding as a Christian Palestinian has a territorial uh, dimension. Another theologian, Naeem Atiq, uh, is an Anglican priest, puts it this way. The Palestinian Christians of today are the descendants of those early Christians. Yet this is no cause for hubris. Uh, with humanity uh, they, that befits their Lord, they accept it as privilege that carries with it a responsibility uh, for uh, service. Uh, in other words, we really have a sense of uh, understanding and, and, and rootedness uh, in this land. We don't think of ourselves as kind of uh, not belonging. The other way around, we feel that we are uh, part of, of, of the story of this land and uh, those of us who stayed here are very uh, determined. And I, I like to, to classify these challenges into five categories. Uh, some of these categories, at least uh, uh, number two and number three, uh, are challenges all Palestinians face. Number one, number four, number five are challenges we face because we are, uh, we face as, as a Christians. They are distinct or unique to our Christian uh, experience. The first one is what I call ecclesiastical challenges. Uh, we have a small number of Palestinian Christians, yet this small number is a bit uh, divided. Uh, not against itself, but uh, it's a fragmented church because of the history. Uh, you've seen the, the figures. Uh, and more importantly, now we're not fighting with one another, but in my humble opinion, we're not working well together. And we don't have a unified leadership. Uh, every head of church in Jerusalem, the 13 recognized churches, uh, are kind of uh, more be, uh, concerned about maintaining the presence of their church. Uh, meanwhile, because many of these churches still have strong Western uh, influences, there is a gap between uh, the people and uh, the leadership. For example, the biggest church here in this region is the Orthodox Church, and it's called the Greek Orthodox Church because the patriarch of the church is Greek, and uh, the church is pretty much governed and led by Greek monks and Greek bishops, even though the congregation themselves are Palestinians. Uh, this, as I said, creates a gap between the leaders and uh, the congregants itself. 
sometimes this gap becomes into a tension and a conflict. Uh, and today there is a conflict between the Orthodox community and the Orthodox patriarch. It's a big conflict where the patriarch himself is not welcomed in many Orthodox churches. Uh, and that really causes a lot of, uh, uh, not just tension, but, uh, uh, you know, with all of these challenges in a time when we all need to work together in unity, to have 40% or so of our body uh, crippled by this problem is, is, really, uh, is really sad. Uh, at the same time, the second biggest church here is the Latin Catholic Church. And right now, uh, they didn't appoint a, a patriarch. Instead, they have what they call uh, the, an apostolic administrator, who is an Italian appointed by the Vatican. Uh, now, he's a good man, and there is no tension. He's actually respected here in the community, uh, welcomed in all churches. But the fact remains is that he's Italian, uh, and that, again, creates this sense of, uh, of guy. He doesn't you know, even speak Arabic. But to me, if you, and with these unprecedented challenges we have, we need strong indigenous leadership. Uh, ironically, uh, the, out of the 13 heads of churches we have in Jerusalem, the only two Palestinians uh, are the Protestants, the Lutherans and the Anglicans, because our ecclesiology demands that we elect our bishops, and it's only natural that we elect Palestinian uh, pastors into that uh, position. Uh, and uh, even though we are small churches, uh, our bishops play uh, a very important role in the public sphere simply because they speak Arabic and they are Palestinians who feel the challenges and are able to communicate not just with our Protestant communities but with the whole uh, community. I hope this makes sense. The second challenge and really by far the biggest challenge is the one of, of, of occupation, the political reality here. As I said, yes, we do have a Palestinian government but in reality we live under uh, the military occupation. Uh, have you seen this map before and do you understand it? What you see here is the small territory of the West Bank. Uh, and the blue uh, dots are the Israeli colonies or settlements and military uh, bases, which are, as you see, all over the West Bank. So you know what a settlement is. It's, 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 it's a Jewish-only community, but they are more than communities today. Uh, in fact, they are. Uh, uh, some of them have, you know, are big cities. Some of them have universities, hospitals. Some of them are bigger than Palestinian cities, uh, like Ariel and Mali Adumim. Many times, not only we cannot access these or live in these uh, or even enter these settlements. Many of these settlements are connected by a system of roads, and we cannot drive on these roads. Uh, and this creates a lot of fragmentation within uh, the West Bank itself. Uh, and then you add to that complicated, so, and settlements are built on Palestinian land, not simply land that we dispute and we say this is ours, they say theirs, and I'm saying it's our land. Many times they're built on privately owned land, land that a family has owned for hundreds of years and farmed and so on. Uh, many times it's built on land that we have documents from the, even the Turkish days that says it's ours. Uh, the same with the roads and the same with the separation wall, which is what you see in the red and purple here, which in some cases cuts deep into the West Bank. The majority of the separation wall is built inside the West Bank. Uh, here it cuts deep to protect the settlements. So imagine your life here as a Palestinian having to always avoid the wall and the settlements. Uh, in this part, it cuts so deep into the West Bank uh, to make of a greater Jerusalem, to increase the area of Jerusalem which Israel annexed and made it part of Israel. Uh, and we are here in Bethlehem, surrounded by one side by the wall, settlements here. Leaving Bethlehem, you cross a checkpoint. We cannot go to the other side, of course. We cannot cross to Israel. Uh, and to go to Ramallah, another Palestinian city, for example, you have to circle around, uh, around the wall. Uh, and by the way, all it takes for Israel to besiege Bethlehem is to close two checkpoints. And then Bethlehem is under siege. And that is not a hypothetical case. That happens a lot. Uh, there are other checkpoints, but they take us to Jerusalem, which we cannot access anyways. Uh, we're not allowed to cross uh, anyways. Just to be very clear, if you are living in Bethlehem as a Palestinian, you're not allowed to go to Israel. No, no. Uh, only a few selected privileged Palestinians can cross. 
those with a valid permit uh, either to work. The majority of those who have the permit, uh, and I'm, we're talking about two to three percent of the Palestinian population, they have it so that they can go to cheap labor in Israel. It's still more, much more than what they would get working here, but they go work in, in building, construction, and factories. Israel grants them this permit because they need them. Uh, and if you go in the morning to the checkpoint, you see them, thousands, lining up in the morning to, to go to work uh, at, at 8 a.m. Uh, but the majority of Palestinians don't have that permit. So that's, and, and it's important to underscore that these things are never reported in the news. How much control Israel has over our lives. And I haven't even talked about water, which Israel controls. Uh, remember that we don't control our borders. Uh, I'm not allowed to travel through Tel Aviv, the airport. I'm going tomorrow to the United States. I have to go uh, to Amman, Jordan. Uh, controlling the borders means that the Israel controls the exports and the imports, and it's slowed and taxed many times. Uh, and controlling the borders means that even, uh, I mentioned the issue of spouses. Uh, there are thousands, I think 20,000 Palestinians who are married to foreign spouses uh, and Israel does not grant them the visa these days. And they're leaving one family at a time. Uh, at the Bible college where I teach, we've lost two faculty members. One of them is married to a Bolivian woman. No visa, we've, married, uh, we've lost another Palestinian woman who's married to an American pastor and Israel does not give them the visa to live here. Uh, the reason, you're married to a Palestinian. Uh, yet at the same time, any Jewish person around the world can move and live in the Holy Land and it will become their home. They will have more rights than the people who lived here for all their lives. And, 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 and we ask, where is justice in this? Uh, how, where is, is this fair? Uh, and to me now, uh, if I am to speak honestly, what we ask even the most, how do Christians support that? You would wish that the Western church is silent uh, and it stays like this. In other words, if you're silent and leave us alone, maybe that's better. Because the Western Church is not silent. The Western Church is part of the problem. It's justifying this, and it's funding this. Uh, and I'm not saying funding it only through taxes. And I'm not sure, you know, we say this, to, you know, or through uh, support from their governments. Uh, we're talking about billions, not million, billions of dollars uh, invested and given from churches, not just to Israel, but even to settlement products, uh, projects and to the army. Uh, theology in seminaries and in churches all over the world is justifying this. Uh, sometimes simple language that Christians use. Take, for example, uh, the common phrase that Jews return to their land. Uh, that, that com that's, many people just say this without thinking what this actually means to Palestinians. Because when you say returned, it immediately assumes that I am taking someone else's property. Whereas, you know, we've been here. Sorry we didn't get the memo that God promised this land 4,000 years ago. Uh, and these are their descendants. We can know that for sure. They're his descendants, Abraham's descendants. And God uh, defines or privileges a certain race. And they're okay. They can leave and come in whenever they want. It doesn't make any sense. But this is what is taught in churches and seminaries. Uh, when you say Jews return to their homeland, does that mean that I cannot call this land home because I've I'm not Jewish. Uh, I always joke, our problem as Palestinians is that we have the wrong DNA and the wrong postal address. And because of that, we've been uh, oppressed and discriminated against by uh, even the church. So if the church was silent, maybe we wouldn't be complaining as much. Our problem is not, I mean, I have this big problem with the silence of the church. I, have, I mean, I write about this all the time. Uh, but in our case, it's not that the church is silent, it's that the church is justifying this through action and through theology. Uh, heck, even through prayer. Uh, prayers are held on, on a weekly basis for Israel and the peace of Jerusalem and the Jewish people. Uh, and sometimes I joke to Christian Zionists, can we get a prayer at least as Palestinians? Okay, we don't want your support, can you pray for us? So there was a question in the bag and then we come here. Uh, okay, what is BDS? BDS is the uh, right now a international movement uh, that 
uh, pretty much originated in 2005 as a response to a call from the Palestinian civil society to do three things, uh, boycott Israel, divest from companies that are working in, with Israel or especially in the occupied territories or in settlements and push for sanctions against Israel. So the three letters, boycott, divest, and sanction become the uh, BDS uh, movement. One of the biggest supporters of the BDS movement in a place like the United States is the uh, young, growing movement among Jewish Americans called Jewish Voices for Peace. Um, and it's interesting because many people think that BDS is anti-Semitic, whereas its biggest supporters right now are, are Jews who are opposing the occupation. Uh, the BDS movement is clear in its goals that we, we are doing these three things in order to end the occupation. Uh, in other words, uh, if the occupation ends, uh, it should be perfectly fine and even encouraged to normalize the relationship with Israel. Uh, and the inspiration of the BDS movement is South Africa. Uh, and it's argued that only when South Africa was boycotted and sanctioned that they, had, uh, that they were forced to get rid of apartheid. Uh, if we, and, and again, the rationale behind the BDS right now is that if we treat Israel like a normal state, uh, we are approving uh, their actions. Uh, the South African leaders, by the way, who visit this land, uh, some of them, and I can remember exactly what they said, church leaders, they said, one of them told me, I can smell apartheid from distance. What you have here is worse than apartheid. And that's what they said. So the rationale with the BDS movement is why are we treating Israel like a normal state? Uh, rather, Israel should be held accountable uh, to uh, what they're doing. Uh, and uh, it is seen as a nonviolent approach uh, to resistance. Uh, and again, it's, it's the inspiration of, of South Africa. Now, when it comes to the Christian position of, of BDS, I'm talking about Palestinian Christians, and I'm talking now about official positions, because many churches has ties with Israel when it comes to visas and properties and so on, church leaders are very careful. And they try to shy away because Israel pretty much threatens them. Uh, and right now, uh, Israel is making it even illegal for anybody uh, if you are openly supporting BDS, and when you arrive at the airport, you will be deported. Uh, and you might face jail time in Israel as an Israeli citizen if you openly support the BDS movement. So uh, that's why many people are becoming afraid. And to be honest, church leaders uh, would not speak openly for the BDS. Uh, activists like in the Kairos movement, uh, uh, looked at BDS and actually encouraged it as a form of creative resistance. Uh, and uh, the rationale is, is simple. Uh, the occupation must be resisted because it doesn't agree with, with God's vision for this land. We are called to resist evil, but we're called to resist evil with good. Uh, we're not for revenge, we're not for violence. So church leaders look at, or the church activists, I mean, the theologians look at the BDS movement, and the words are, this is an expression of nonviolent resistance. When people ask me about the BDS, I say, would you rather have someone blow himself or herself up and kill civilians in Tel Aviv for the Israeli society to realize that there is occupation here, or, or BDS, or uh, nonviolent resistance? It's complicated because some expressions of the BDS movement around the world, if I am honest, are anti-Semitic. Some expressions. There are some activists, pro-Palestinian activists, that say horrible things that even we as church leaders, you say, no, this, this, you know, I don't want to be associated with that, okay? However, what we have a problem with, what I would say I have a problem with, is churches that simply seek to be diplomatic and are too nice and too polite in their language uh, and would not, uh, would not say anything remotely offensive or that might be interpreted as supporting the BDS. Uh, and if you, if you do so, in my opinion, you are complicit. You are contributing, participating, because you are normalizing the occupation. If, if you want to do it with nuance and, and 
you know, good language and so on, I understand. But as long as you're clear as churches where you stand when it comes to the, uh, to the occupation. There are churches who are not willing to engage with Palestinians and Palestinian Christian leaders because of their position of BDS. Uh, so they're more concerned with our position on BDS more than they are concerned with the occupation itself. Uh, and they are trying to tell us how to resist. Which really doesn't make any sense, that you're speaking from a position of power as a church, uh, and you're speaking from outside. You see a brother in Christ who is suffering, and you tell me, I will only sympathize with you if you, moder if you uh, moderate your language, if you, uh, you know, tune down your language and speak uh, nicely uh, and, and shy away from BDS and, and, and uh, trying as if to put conditions so that you can be compassionate with me. Or, no, we don't want that compassion. Okay? If you're more concerned about my language, if it's offensive, rather than my suffering itself, uh, I have a problem with that. Uh, if we work together with Jewish, Israeli, and um, Jewish American allies to end the occupation, uh, then we are preparing the, 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 the field for not just coexistence, but really living together in harmony and, and as friends. And this is what we should seek. So it cannot be that we fight for this alone. And it shouldn't be that we fight for this, uh, for this alone. Uh, and in just one final comment, uh, a lot of this nonviolent resistance in Palestine is done and led by Muslims. Uh, so I don't want you to come. I don't want people to interpret that it's only Christians who are promoting nonviolence, and Christians and Jews can, will get along. No, no, we're talking about even Christian Jews and Muslims who can get along. I'm convinced of that. And nonviolence actually provides something, a tool that we work together uh, with.